Greetings, Chromatic Warriors. Coming to you today in association with Age of Squid Mar Miniatures. Big thanks for including Mia on this project and the associated Kickstarter. This model has been a joy to paint, and I'm not just saying that. I could say anything I want right now, but I just want to say, first of all, that this model had a, a very, very healthy combination of tension and release. Compact details that add flavor and character to the sculpt, and wide open spaces where you can paint and blend and create and play. So, um, check the links down below if you'd like to kind of follow up on more of my endeavors, my Patreon, my uh, set of brushes that I'll be using in this video. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a longer video, I understand that. Um, so I've included some timestamps down below to make things easier on you. And just take it at your leisure. I've tried to pack a lot into this. So I hope you enjoy, and without any further ado and expanding of the time that it takes to watch this, let's get into it. In the beginning, there was a very old ripped shaman and his many animal pals. He's missing one arm for now for ease of painting, and I'm also going to remove his head. Um, but first of all, He's primed in black and white, just your standard zenithal overspray. This will all be covered up in the end, but it does give me some indication of where I'd like some of the broader highlights to fall. You know, you can see a bit of a gradient on his leg, there's some intensity on the top of the thigh. The first thing I want to do is plot the course for his skin. Up in the palette cam in the corner, this is just a regular puddle of water no extender or anything being used, although if you are new to painting, I encourage you to give it a try. This is coal black from P3, and then green, brown, buff, white, and carmine red, all from the Vallejo model color range. First thing I want to do is a bit of the wet blending. Oh yeah, this isn't attached either. So I'll be throwing coal black into the deepest recesses. Um, yeah, I'll be doing like a three color wet blend here at minimum. Not for the faint of heart, but I believe in you. Try something, challenge yourself, do something a little more advanced. Yeah, just taking large undiluted amounts of green brown, sweeping them together, just generally accenting all these volumes. On this brighter area, it will be pure green-brown. Don't worry if it looks a little bit messy. That's wet blending for you. It's always a little bit messy at the start, but we will refine it later with many glazes and finer touches. I'll take the buff and just paying attention to these upward facing angles right where these muscles connect to each other there's a nice creased line there I want to get a nice sharp definition in fact let me get a little bit closer on that thigh I just want to point out that Although I'm using coal black for my most intense shadow, I'm not using it at all in this brighter highlight area. And we'll just continue. We'll work this leg up. I can paint the rest of his body off camera, but just for the sake of example, demonstration, we'll concentrate on this one very muscular leg. So we'll keep that coal black, green brown flowing. Um, I will be adding portions of buff, but as I'm working on this lower leg area, I want to add much smaller portions. So just the, I could probably lay down more green brown. You notice I haven't really cleaned my brush out very much either. It's not terribly important. Again, you know, I'll be defining things a little more clearly in the future with many thin glazed layers. I 
just like so. So, not too bad, not too good. I will continue to define things with further layers of wet blending. The pushing and pulling nature of this technique tends to leave a somewhat streak streaky result at times. So, just like with every other technique, it's going to look better if you lay on multiple layers. Yeah, just basically moving through that same progression one more time. Sometimes I lick the brush off and just go in with more of a naked uh, bristle. Just using the brush like a blending nub. Kind of work that dividing line. Again, just with no paint on the brush, using it as a bit of a blending nub. I might pick some paint up here and there. Could accidentally go into other areas. It all smooths out. By using a larger, thicker amount of paint, it's giving me more work time. And I like to, I don't dilute the paint when I'm wet blending. You, you can wet blend, you know, subtle uh, glazy layers. That's all fine. But when I'm wet blending, I don't dilute the paint because I want it to maintain sort of a thicker, sticky consistency so it stays where I put it. And that is how the leg is navigated. So let me sweep these tones across the rest of this body. We'll jump back for the next step. All right, very rough wet blending pass has taken place. You can see how the light sourcing at this stage mimics the light sourcing from the zenithal overspray. But now let us take a look at this man's chest and torso. It's down to the many fine layers level. Just want to make sure that I'm, I'm controlling that same light sourcing as I work my way up. So these lower areas will mainly be highlighted with some diluted green-brown. That as I'm going upwards, it's going to break into more of this buff area. Just like so. You can see I'm just using the tiniest amount, very controllable amount of paint. Let's kind of very gradually work these glazes up and there there are a lot of areas where I'm going to have to mix and match taking a little bit of coal black and green brown and just saturating a lot of these in-between tones you know is my initial pass with three colors being wet blended together it leaves a lot of variety in between that's the fun thing about wet blending it creates that gradient you know from point a to b and you can take some pretty large jumps when you're wet blending uh darker and lighter colors together so we'll have to mix and match here and there and i always like to say stick to the rule of threes i'm going through and i'm laying down many thin layers um, you know, they are composed of multiple brush strokes, but I want to lay down at least three layers of every color before I see a passable result. You know, generally one, one blended layer doesn't look so good, but the gradual accumulation of many thin layers gives us that smooth and saturated result. So, rule of threes. At minimum, I will be laying down three layers of every color. Sometimes certain colors take a little bit more depending on their composition, but just do at least three so you can see where things are going. Don't give up after that first coat. 
a lot of the time I think people expect the first pass to be just a perfect version of the fifth and sixth pass but we know we have to layer up those small grains of pigment and you can see as I'm working along here I have the chance to sharpen things up I want to be tucking my shadows in to the highlights right below them this armpit is a good example my personal preference I like very sharp drastic cuts and contrast and line work these gradients I like to have everything looking nice and defined as if this model is sitting under that perfect lighting situation so I'll be pushing my green brown right up to the top of this under arm muscle yeah dragging just small amounts of coal black here and there I may lick the brush just use a little bit of that good old-fashioned saliva to drag and smooth things out most of the paint is already off of the brush by the time I'm licking it but you know you may end up eating just a little bit of paint I also have much brighter to go in my progression so I'll just be adding a little bit of white in with that buff and again just mindfully applying these highlights a lot of the time you, need, you get to that close to that final highlight color less is more in a progression you can really set things off with just a very kind of careful intelligent approach to the highlighting process yeah just less is more is the motto I apply a lot of the time and again you know I, I prefer more kind of drastic harsh light situations so if you want a little bit of a softer look I think larger broader highlighted surfaces will give you just that but I just wanted to let you know the how this kind of push to a highlight has gone from coal black all the way up to now a white and basically ivory mixture. Carve out those abs, but you see just how the you know that tiniest portion can really kind of drive the focus from the bottom to the top. I, I still have more uh, subtleties that I'd like to work in to these abs. I mean, all these muscle areas need a lot more saturation and it's kind of generally working on that, that very subtle build to the top. But yeah, just very small targeted areas of highlight. always sweeping away just take note how much distance I'm getting out of every brush load of paint you know I'm, I'm working with these very very scant amounts very thin consistency almost a dirty paint water level of dilution and you can also see in the palette cam as I'm working along how you know more and more of these kind of subtle off tones are gathering as I'm just mixing and matching, going through my highlights. But I have a lot of work to do and I won't make you sit through the entire process. I just wanted to lay down some information on how I'm visualizing this and as well as the colors that I'm using. So allow me to step back behind the curtain and use some editing magic to jump ahead to the next step. I'll be smoothing this for a couple hours, I would imagine. Oh yeah, look at that green body. So I'm still working on the skin, but I've come to a fun part, the part where we can add a little bit of liveliness, more flesh-like tones to the whole project. Um, off to the side, I've got my carmine red, my green brown. I'll be combining those 
diluting it down to a nice thin glaze-like consistency. And just pretty much wherever I feel like it, I'll be adding a slight pinkish hue. Um, some thoughts guiding me on this decision. Generally, there are certain areas of the human body that become more flushed if the weather is cold or if there is a lot of physical activity, whatever. You can make a lot of excuses for yourself to uh, add some more interesting colors to the situation. I am not sticking to any strict rules here. This is, this is kind of the, the intersection between what is realistic and what looks good you know, as, as an artistic choice creating more of an animated result. Like obviously human beings are not green, but I've chosen to largely make this guy look green. So just going with the rule of cool as my main guide and that you know, little bit of notion about certain areas of the body being a little bit more flushed than others, that's what's guiding me to add this pinkish hue to everything. I'll be throwing it onto the elbows, the knees, creases of the elbows, and I'll be bringing it into play on the face as well. You know, just kind of livening up that nose under and over the eyes. Just love the effect that this has. Sometimes the only question we must ask ourselves is, what would Frank Frazetta do? He would lean hard into kind of overexpressing those subtle tones. This man is screaming, perhaps at a churning sea, so just the smallest excuse is all I need to make his face look a little bit more flushed. Uh, the reason I'm just kind of throwing this bit in here is because I, I want to get the skin highlighted to a certain level, kind of bring some of these more flushed areas into play, and then reapply some of the highlights. You know, obviously glazing pinkish red two or three coats over a certain area will subdue some of those final highlights. So once I've added that pinkish hue, I want to bring my buff and white mixture back out. It's transparent enough where all of those shadows and some of that greenish hue still shows through. But yeah, just Pulling up those final highest peaks. Carve that red up underneath his eye. Oh yes, oh yes. He's got the look. Da 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 da. The skin is looking nice. I still have more work, more refinement and layering that I'd like to add to it, but Miniature painting is very touch and go, and a lot of the time when you see tutorials, the way I paint is not in this one, two, three, four kind of approach. I go back and forth quite often, repeating steps, adding layers and balancing things where they're needed. So it's not a, not a very straightforward process. A lot of the time it requires a little bit of balancing and analyzing. With that said, it's time to work on some of the cloaks. Let's get a little bit of darkness in to counteract some of these brighter areas. So on the palette, I have dark Prussian blue and black, also some German gray, all from Vallejo model color. I'll be mixing the black and the Prussian blue together, sweeping it in place. And just like with the skin, I'll be starting this off with a nice pass of wet blending. You can also kind of see, a lot of time I tell people to look at what the light is telling me. And that is what our, you know, zenithal base coat has also helped to inform. I can see it's a little bit of a darker area running between this expressed area of the cloak, as well as that area that dips down a little bit. Yet it is still exposed to some light. So I'll be using my German gray, my black and blue mixture, wet blending those together, kind of lock in these larger channels of light. 
Also, as I'm moving along, these areas are still wet. I want to make this cloak look a little tattered and worn. Grab some white, just the smallest amount of German gray to that. And then, just using kind of a larger, broader brush, just be stippling things until I get a nice balance of texture and tone. You can go back to that German gray, kind of balance out the mid-tones a little bit, but kind of my underlying theory here is that light exposes detail. So as the certain areas of the cloak dip into the shadow, they become smooth. When they're exposed to the light, more of this texture is able to show. That's the basic philosophy. Now after that area is dry, We'll go back to the German gray and white mixture. I'll mix up a little bit more of that sauce. But all I'm trying to do is bring it up one more stage in lightness. It's very diluted. Um, take a very thin amount on my brush. The idea here is when it dries, it's going to have some level of transparency. And the more of these layers that I add, the more intersections I'll have with the texture. These stippled layers will kind of show the previous layers, have some overlaps creating larger amounts of saturation, and then that will guide me and tell me which areas to highlight with smaller, scratchier highlights. Looks a little intense at first, but as it dries you can see it dulls down. Acrylics have a tendency to desaturate as they dry especially when you leave them overnight. Now very selectively, with still with that same color, I want to do a couple things. I need to drop some edge highlights. There's a certain amount of texture and flaps of fabric sculpted into this cloak. So I want to make sure I don't ignore those subtle textures. And I also just want to add pretty much playing upon the the same technique where I'm you know I'm laying down very thin amounts of paint but a much more targeted approach you know right where this kind of highest bulge in the, the cloak is that's where I'm going to concentrate my efforts and just kind of placing and pushing these small transparent coats of paint maintaining that texture which is the easy part. If you want texture, just don't blend. You'll just have to be working that up like so. As you can see, there's a lot of cape to paint, so again, allow me to fast forward through the power of editing and through time travel. We'll see this in mere moments. And here is where his gorgeous flowing robes are sitting. You can see I've been adding a little bit more texture on top of that stippled result. I'm liking how that's coming together. It's giving the fabric a woven look. And it's very simple. Just adding a little bit more white to that gray. And very lightly pressing very gently so I get a nice thin semi-transparent line. Wherever the highlights are the brightest, I'll make these lines, they're most compact, and then as the highlights break away and it goes back into the, the stippling layer, I'll let it breathe a little bit. I'll also be taking from that black and Prussian blue mixture, and wherever the most intense shadows are, I'll be glazing over those areas as well. Just kind of sharpening things, it's helping to bond that texture in to the shadows as well. And maybe just a little final touch of some white, just lifting and dropping the brush along the edge. This looks very tattered and rough. The rough, salty robes of the seaside shaman. For those leather wrappings, all of your supplements for wrist, ankle, and bicep support. First thing I did is take 
a little bit of black, a little bit of coal black, and bloodstone. Because I want, want to keep everything rooted in greenish hues, most of the areas of this model. That's why I'm pulling a little bit of coal black into what normally I would just add some black to the bloodstone. But I want to capture more of this greenish atmosphere. So yeah, just throwing a little bit of a green tone into the root of this progression. Give me a little bit more of that tied together look. And with that laid down, I'll jump right up to the bloodstone. And you can see how the light is falling on the front of the model's shin. That's my kind of uh, intended photographic angle. That'll be kind of the, the final resting point when someone is viewing this model. So I want to direct all the light forward in that way. You know, it's falling behind his loincloth onto the back of his leg. That area will be descending into shadow and as things wrap around and come to the forefront, more of these highlights are revealed. So we'll just create our target area with bloodstone, first of all. Next up, I'll just be operating within that small boundary created by the bloodstone. So I'm going to combine bloodstone with a little bit of buff. And we'll just carve some very fine highlights in place. Remember, less is more. Going for more of a dramatic, kind of harsh light situation. So just a very small portion of a highlight. Let that shadow and midtone area breathe. And then polishing that off with just some tiny dots and slashes of buff. Keep it mainly focused to the lower area of his ankle as well. Just to again, you know, kind of force that harsher light situation. His knee creates a bit of a shadow. A little bit more light would be catching below by his ankle. Just like so. Let's talk about that fur. To my palette, I've added Trader Green from P3, Deck Tan, and White from Vallejo. I'll probably be pulling from some of the colors I used in the previous step. First of all, Let's take some Trader Green, some Black, and again, just for that little bit of a green tie-in, some Coal Black. Now, first, I'm kind of looking at these. The fur is, is kind of sectioned off into clumps. You know, it, you can see some kind of larger shapes, even though all of this texture is sculpted in place. So. I'm going to be looking at it like so, you know, just kind of zooming out visually a little bit and trying to nail down some of these larger portions. Never mind the little critter in the fur. We'll get to him later. For now, we must paint the fur that he sits on top of. So just Trader Green plus that darker mix. Make sure I get into every little crease and crevice. Now with that rough rendering in place, I'll be kind of jumping around between the Trader Green and the Deck Tan. I want to be picking out all of these textures, but still maintaining the gradient that I laid in place with that last step. So in the darker areas, I'll be highlighting with Trader Green in the brighter areas of using deck tan. And generally I'm kind of planting my highlight at the uh, top of these tufts of fur where it's tucking into the pelt. Just like so. All right, back in action, carving my way through this mess. This area looks weird right now. You can see the socket where his head is going to lay, the little critter on his back, its paws are resting in the fur. 
It's a mess, but it's messy fur, so I think we're doing it right. I just wanted to add that the final touch will be a small white highlight. Again, just a very, very small measured amount, just at the peak of these tufts of hair. Less is more. Just to really round out that gradient, you know, sometimes, especially on a heavily textured area, just making sure there's enough variety of colors. There's enough distance from the lowest highlight to the brightest peak that we get some contrast. It doesn't have to be particularly smooth, just include a large amount of colors in the progression. And if I want to get really uh, tedious about it, in some of these brighter areas, I can go glaze a little bit of that trader green down towards the bottoms of these pieces of fur. It's a little too dark around this area, but I just wanted to share this because painting is a balancing act. That is the approach I'll be using to balancing this fur out. So allow me to continue. I'll get the rest of this model charted out. We'll jump back for the next step. Let's talk about that bone tone. To my palette, I've added Thornwood Green and Arcane Blue from P3. This model has various decorations all over its body, which I heavily approve of. He's got all kinds of fangs, skulls, and femurs decorating his person. It's a real sharp look. First thing that I'll do is lay down a base coat of Thornwood Green covering about half the object in this case when I'm zeroing in on these fangs. Then I'll wet blend buff into the equation, covering that upper half. And once that's in place, I'll be taking buff and amounts of white, create the highlights in the brighter areas. And I want to imply a little more texture than what is sculpted, so I'll be using these kind of liney highlights, just adding a little bit more of that bone texture. And in the darker areas as the bones grow out, I'll be taking some black. Combine that with just a touch of thornwood green, and very gradually glazing to a darker and darker progression towards the tips of all these fangs and horns, you know, as they grow out, keratin accumulates and becomes darker. Not so much in the case of the fangs, but we're here to make executive decisions. I want to make creative choices. And basically, I think fangs look cooler this way. Once the tips of those bones are suitably darkened, I'll be taking some of that arcane blue, a little bit of black, and a little bit of white. So I'm making kind of a turquoise gray and towards the tips, just add a very slight highlight, just leading right to that point. This is a way of, whenever I've seen decayed bone, it can create some unique colors depending on the situation it deteriorated in. So in, in that line of thought, almost any color can be produced in the right situation of decay. So I'm free to choose as I would like. I like adding a little bit of this colder tone into the situation. I think overall it looks nice with the rest of the composition. But once I have my kind of grayed out turquoise mixed up, I'll just be slowly adding larger amounts of white, just covering less and less. I'll be brightening things up until I get to a final white tip on each one of these bones. To my palette, I've added Guncore Brown from P3. We're getting into some of the smaller bejangly bits. He has these, uh, hmm, clackers on his belt. I'm not exactly sure what these are. I think there's some kind of rattle. 
This guy likes to stir up a lot of noise as he's moving about his business, doing his magical dance. But I'll be taking that Guncore Brown, wet blending it together with that coal black and regular black mixture from earlier. I'm just making sure that any of these kind of textured accents sculpted in place are picked out with the Guncore Brown. With that gradient in place, I'll be adding a small amount of buff to the Guncore Brown. I'm just going up a step in brightness, pick out all of these finer sockets and micro textures. I just generally kind of stippling here and there, edge highlighting some of these textures, just pulling things up a bit. Then I'll round that off the final highlight of buff. And in some areas where I'd like more separation, we have the leather strands kind of laced through these objects. Just dilute down a little bit of that dark uh, coal black and black mixture. Just very gently kind of line around these details so everything is nice and separated. Uh, excuse me, sir, there's a squirrel on your belt. So obviously by this point, I think we've seen my common method to starting off a progression is with wet blending. So the squirrel here has been wet blended with some of that coal black and regular black mixture. And I've used bloodstone as the brighter tone. And after that's been laid in place, I'll just be combining a little bit of that darker mixture with some bloodstone and glazing into the shadows, just accenting all those downward facing angles on this poor deceased squirrel. Once I'm satisfied with that, I'll be taking some of that Guncore Brown, combining that with Bloodstone, create my lighter tones. I'll just lay in a series of highlights, make sure that eye is closed on the sleeping squirrel. Yeah, I'll just be picking out these upward facing angles. The Guncore Brown is nice as a mix up in this situation because it's going to just be slightly different than all of that leather wrapping that's kind of holding a lot of his, his uh, trinkets together. Sure, I'll highlight it up with some buff, but it's nice to just have a subtle difference in tone. So there's Mr. Squirrel. Just bring some buff into that mixture and begin chopping away, just <laughs> yes, chopping away on a dead squirrel. Here and there, I will add, you know, a bit of a textured progression. Again, as the light exposes more detail, the shadows can be smooth, the raised areas can be textured. That's what I tell myself. But I want the squirrel to be furry. So just imply a little bit of texture. I always appreciate when a sculpt has a semi-smooth furred area so you can do a little bit of brush dancing. And then to that mixture I'll add a little bit of white to go even brighter. It's giving me a nice kind of orangish tone. I haven't gone, you know, full buff yet, which you've probably also noticed throughout this project. It's a nice harmonizing highlight tone. And what would that be on your other hip, sir? Another uh, sleeping animal? Some kind of pigeon? I like it. On the palette, I've base coated the model with a mixture of black and white, just creating this neutral gray. Figured I'd save you a little bit of time, paint that in. But I'll be taking this gray and wet blending some buff in with it. Making sure to let that gray breathe a little bit. So that gives me so that gives me a nice gray and ivory mix. I'll just quickly go through and add more highlights with buff. Just carving out a little bit more of that ivory, making it more prominent. And with the ivory in place, it was time for some very slight white highlights. Just running along all the sharp edges that I can find. I want this to read as a, a white dove, but white is always an interesting color because 
it's your maximum highlight color, you know? So what do I highlight white with? More white? I don't know. So in that way, everything working up to it is, is an off tone. It's an off white. So you can find a lot of freedom in those off tones. In this case, just that gray and ivory mixture harmonizes nicely with everything else. So I'm happy with it. The black feathers of the raven were first base coated with the mixture of black and Prussian blue, which may you recall from days ago when I was working on the cloak. I'll add more blue in with that black and then bring some white in to that mixture. And just very carefully, I still want these to read as black, so I'm going to let the shadows breathe a lot. Just adding these, just going along with the texture that's already been sculpted onto the feathers. With that icier blue tone, and I'll go up to a nearly pure white. I'll just place small dots on the edges of the feathers. Right along the center here, just a very, you know, just a very tight and sharp highlighted area. So I want the feathers to have sort of a glossy look to them. It's nothing too complex, but it is worth noting that this is the same color combination used to create the cloak, except the portions are different. Adding, you know, more blue and more white to this situation gives me more of a pure kind of icy tone opposed to adding more black would produce more of a grayed out tone that we see on the cloak. Neat. Oh, I've been waiting for this moment. It's time to talk about that beard. On the palette, I have refreshed my mixture of black and coal black down here, and I'll just be taking from some Guncore brown and some white. So it's going to look something like so. Take that coal black and black mixture, I want this to look like uh, black hair, but keeping this greenish hue in mind. So then I'll be breaking up into a pure white. And I'll be crossing that Guncore brown line in the middle. So the progression will be somewhat like that. First things first though, I'll need to lay down just a nice even base coat of that black and coal black mixture. All right, with that base coat in place, as previewed before, I've added a bit of that Guncore brown to my mixture of the two blacks. Best way, I think, to think about hair is imagine it's a reflective surface, because it is. You know, it once it's properly conditioned and shampooed, it shimmers and shines. So wherever the hair is bending or bowing downwards that's where the light will be collecting and generally as i lead towards the end of the beard i want my highlights to be less intense I have more brighter areas leading closer to the face you know think of this as a light reflective object versus a light absorbent object and have a much more dramatic interaction with the light shining down on it. Those initial reflections in place, I'm starting to move into the area where I've mixed more white into my color progression. And yeah, just making sure to cover much smaller area than before. I'm using a much more fine brush as well. And again, it's all about portion control. I want very small highlighted areas, large mid-tone and shadow areas. That's just the kind of look I've been preferring lately. So why not do what I like? Yeah, it's turning a little bit gray in these highlight areas, but I'm okay with that. I want them to be showing a bit of age. I was unsure whether I wanted to just straight up give him a white beard, but like this. There's still a little bit of his original hair color from maybe his younger days. As you've probably learned by now, this will also come to a final graduation point with just the tiniest white dot. And 
My compliments to the sculptor once again for adding just the right amount of texture. Too much texture and sculpted hair can bog you down, can be too deep, but this is really well done. It's just the right amount. And here we go, just one final pass of near white highlights. Some of that root color is still mixed in, and I don't mind. It's going to appear as though it's white, but it is just a very slight off-white. I'll just slip these in in the tiniest of dots and slashes, just like so. Real quick regarding the handle, it's been base coated with German Grey and I have a 50-50 mixture of German Grey and Dac Tan. I'll just be picking out all of the wood grain, just a little bit of simple lining. I do want to make sure that generally as the eye goes upwards on the handle of this staff that the highlights become brighter. So I'll be focusing my efforts more on the kind of upward direction. And then we'll add a little bit of pure German gray. Again, just in very, very small portions. You know, compared to the area that I just covered with that mixture, this is very, very much, much less. I'm covering about 5 to 10% of the area that I just covered. To my palette, I've added a little sepia ink from Dyla Rowney's FW line. I'll throw a little bit of black into that, about a 50-50 mixture of black paint and ink. I'll water it down, create my own wash. The idea here is that I get the viscosity of the ink and the opaque qualities of a black paint. Normally ink runs a little glossy, but it's a very quick, easy way to kind of filter this down into a wood-ish tone. It looks like very darkened hardwood, and I'm into that. Let's talk about that magical stone. I mean, I assume it's a magical stone. Why else would this man be carrying around some nearly inanimate rock around on the top of his staff? Anyways, I am wet blending. You can see I'm just laying this down to create a little bit of extra texture. I'm stippling things in place with a damp brush. It's just German Grey and Deck Tan. And now to deeper imply its magical properties, I like to weave the color green into the base. I'll be combining Ortic Olive and German Grey together. And while everything is still semi-damp, just be stippling it into the base. Stippling! Nail it on the second take. We also have this viney root wrapping around the stone. We'll take care of that in a moment. Now another way of implying that it has magical properties, kind of imagining there are invisible strands of mana coursing around the stone. Take a little bit of arcane blue and just uh, somewhat randomly create some veins of magic. See I'm just using some very thin parallel lines have this magical turquoise draped over the stone. And it's going to take a few passes to really get it to show up. It's going straight turquoise over whatever lies underneath. It's kind of a bold jump. And as I'm continuing to treat these lines, I'll add a little bit of white to my arcane blue. It's brightening things up a little bit and just adding another little channel of mana to the middle. Now before I add to the rock works, I've base coated the, the roots, all these little vines, with Ortic Olive, and I'll be dropping a highlight of lime green, just on the little knots, crooks, crevices, wherever the vines bend. I just want to pick that little area out. Now with that slight bit of magic traced out, 
Let's get these vines taken care of before we move back to the rock. So it's been base coated with Ortic Olive and I'll just be adding a slight highlight of lime green wherever there's a little bend or bubble in the vine. That's my target. Oh yeah, looking good. Let's take some of that Ortic Olive, that German Gray, just water it down, create a nice washy coat a green gray take a very small amount and well probably a larger amount than that I want it to have some of an effect but yeah it's just kind of juicing the stone down the vines as well let this seep into the crevices just be careful not to leave too much in one place you know you just want a nice thin glaze and all over coating it will slightly seep into the crevices but too much will be a bad thing you can always go back and add more if you like so when you're glazing just keep it real light i also want to take the same glaze and drag it out onto some of the bone areas i will probably highlight the bone again it needs a little bit more treatment but I wanted to leave it lie until I got these green vines laid down because, yeah, I had a plan. So far, so good. But the idea is all of this green magic radiating from the base of this stone and this vine work. So yeah, we will just lightly be blending a little bit of green around the surrounding area. Well, our green gray mixture. Next up, I'll be taking a little bit of light green. Um, this was unplanned. I threw a bunch of colors onto my palette. I thought maybe this would come in handy, could be useful. I could end up not using it. But I'm finding that it's working well to bring more of the vibrant green magical hue that I'm after. So I'll just be dropping a slight highlight, slight green, and on these stone areas, we'll leave the vines alone. Pulling some edge highlights out here and there, and maybe just dragging some more just thin lines, coursing magic. Almost like lightning, but not quite. Of mimicking the smooth reflections of a pool of water. And then, finally, I say it with a question mark in regards to highlighting the stone. My instincts are leading me to lay some deck tan down. It's a nice warm gray, just picking out the edges, also implying a little bit of extra stony texture in certain areas that would catch more light texturizing that just a little bit just kind of dropping and pushing creating a very irregular stony texture subduing a bit of that hidden magic lifting and dropping again to you know imply a little more texture instead of a straight edge highlight alrighty with that out of the way bring a little bit of white into this lime green. I just want to add more dimension to these roots, holding the old magic stone in place. Just a little touch of a highlight. All right, and now to really cap it off and send home that magical feeling, I've added some lime green ink from the FW line, Dyler Rowney, yada yada. Mix it with lime green paint, so I get the viscosity of the ink, the opacity of the paint, and oh so tenderly, I'll be dropping that wash into all the creases around the vine, getting this magical viridescent energy coursing just underneath these vines. 
I may have to do this in multiple passes. I'm laying down a controllable amount of this wash, but as it dries, it may not be so saturated. I will find out later, but just bear that in mind. Lay a little bit down at a time, come back to it and decide if it's intense enough. Mister, what's that critter on your back? Well, it's not necessary to always know what something is in order to paint it and bring it to life. So this will be very similar to the fur cloak. On my palette, I've added dark blue pale and I've mixed together black and ortic olive to create my root, my soupy root. And yeah, just like with his fur shawl, we'll be starting this off with a wet blend, just looking at the kind of larger dimensions ignoring all that texture for for the moment so just be that darker mixture up into dark blue pale quickly swipe my brush off on my towel and then with a little bit of dark blue pale still involved on the tip of my brush i'll be bringing white in for the top of that progression following that initial wet blended base coat it's down to picking some of the finer textures out of which there is a lot that's cool with me it's just gonna take a little while to get it all brushed in but what I'll be doing in some of these lower areas where the shadow is more of that greenish tone my highlight tone highlight color will be dark blue pale then as I move upwards in the progression, I'll be adding more white to that dark blue pale. And then, you guessed it, adding even more white into that dark blue pale mixture. I don't think I'll go up to fully bright white. I kind of like to leave that off the table, save it for one kind of final victory lap, deciding if I want any specific areas to reach a pure white level. But yeah, you can see I have my work cut out for me, but I'm just going to get comfortable and work that progression in to all this fine fur texture. And there you have it. Can you dig it? Thank you for making it through this entire video. It incorporates a lot, but it really does lay out a variety of techniques and information theory that wrap into this model so yeah as always i had a blast painting this figure every project i'm working on that's my favorite project so a big thank you um, i appreciate you making it through the video and i hope it was informative for you as it was fun for me and i'm very proud of this piece this is one for the resume so yeah, I have nothing but thanks and good feelings after enjoying some happy meditative painting time. So, until the next time we meet, remain unchained, my friends.